Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jeff Lejeune. I'm a food safety officer at FAO based in our headquarters in Rome. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to another rendition of Knowledge Dissemination Dialogues on Antimicrobial Resistance, or AMR. Um, today's talk will be on antimicrobial resistance and one health approaches to address uh, the livestock sector in South Africa. Uh, into uh, to integrated AMR surveillance in the Caribbean. So uh, a range of information will be provided for you. I just have a few uh, disclaimers and notes to start uh, before I introduce uh, Eric Etter. Uh, Eric uh, works with CIRAD, so the, uh, the French um, Agricultural Research Center for International Development. Uh, and he's also the uh, Secretariat for Carib Vet, an association of Caribbean veterinarians. But uh, before we move to that, uh, let me just please mention uh, a couple of things. We'd ask for the uh, politeness to keep your microphones on mute as you move forward. Uh, rename yourself, and I'll do that to my for my uh, contact information here shortly with your organization in the country, followed by your name, so we know who's listening and who we're talking to. Uh, just to make sure that the, we tell you that the views expressed are those of Eric and not those of FAO specifically. Uh, we do have a chat, which we welcome your questions, uh, which we'll get to at the end of the session. But we just ask you to refrain from mentioning any uh, company or commercial products or brands in the chat. And then uh, with that, I think we'll move forward. The session today is being recorded. Uh, so if you do not wish to be recorded, uh, just refrain from saying anything. Or um, And we will post this at a later time on our uh, FAO YouTube channel. So with that, I'm going to pass over to Eric, ask you to share your screen. And then we will uh, move into the presentation followed by the questions. Eric, the screen is all yours. Thanks. Jeff, uh, do you all see the full screen? Uh, we see you, thank you. Yeah, so and now you, you have the full screen uh, of the presentation. I do see a presentation, yes. Okay. So thanks everybody uh, for attending uh, this webinar. And uh, I thank also FAO for inviting me uh, to present uh, on antimicrobial resistance and one else approach. And I will talk to you today about the livestock sector in South Africa to until the uh, integrated uh, antimicrobial resistance surveillance in the Caribbean. So, Obviously, uh, you are all aware about the importance of antimicrobial resistance. I just remind you this uh, prospective modeling uh, done in uh, 2014 about the deaths uh, attributable to AMR uh, by 2050. And we can see that it's a, a major concern for all over the world. And uh, Africa is uh, specifically at risk, uh, and uh, the Caribbean region is not uh, very highlighted here, but we will see that we don't have lots of, of data for it. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, view of the, of the world is uh, the global prediction of uh, AMR abundance. Uh, for human beings, for human medicine. So this is the first map uh, in, uh, in blue on top uh, left. And uh, we can see again 
that uh, Africa is of major concern. We, uh, and we can link that uh, with also the AMR uh, rate in animals, uh, where we can see some uh, quite different things, uh, where Asia here is, uh, is more of my major concern than for, for, for human. And it's interesting also to, to have a look uh, to this uh, global map of uh, abundance of soil uh, anti, uh, antibiotic resistance genes uh, produced uh, two years ago, where we can see again uh, some, uh, some concern for for uh, for Africa, but uh, and uh, Southeast Asia, but uh, it's it's quite interesting to see that also uh, Europe is a, a major concern and uh, North America. So it's quite different things, but they are all linked together, and we I will try to show you that uh, within this presentation. So why uh, South Africa and uh, Caribbean? Um, First of all, because you've seen that uh, in Africa, this uh, this AMR is of major concern, and uh, as I said before, uh, we don't have lots of data for for Caribbean, so it's also interesting to have a focus on it, and perhaps also because I spent uh, ten years in Southern Africa working with uh, with colleagues there uh, since uh, and uh, until I uh, arrived. In, uh, in Caribbean uh, four years ago, where I'm currently working in Guadeloupe. So <clears throat> first of all, for South Africa, this is uh, interesting because uh, we have quite a unique situation regarding legislation where antibiotics are governed by two different acts. The first one uh, from 1947 is uh, is uh, about fertilizer, farm feeds, agricultural remedies, and stock remedies. And uh, for this uh, antibiotic register under this act, there is no need for prescription. The second uh, act uh, that is uh, regulating antibiotics is the Medicine and Related Substance Control Act from 1965 for which uh, each of uh, these antibiotic register uh, within this act needs uh, need pres prescriptions. Regarding uh, food producing animals, uh, the antimicrobials uh, register in South, uh, South Africa, we've got two, 234 of them with uh, almost three quarter register within the, the first act, the Agriculture Act, and uh, a quarter, a little bit more than a quarter, uh, uh, register uh, with uh, the, the Medicine Act. <clears throat> and these include gross promoters. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later, but it's quite uh, important to know that uh, gross promoter uh, antibiotic as uh, gross promoters are used in, in South Africa. And part of them are registered on major, the majority are registered with the, within the Agriculture Act and uh, part of, of them, a small part of them within the Medicine Act. Uh, and we, we, it's important also to know that uh, 64 uh, antimicrobials were registered for in-feed inclusion uh, within this uh, first act and only five register with the with, uh, Medicine Act. So we see this duality between uh, within the, the legislation that will have an impact. We'll see that on, on uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance. So <clears throat> AMR is not uh, a new concern for, for, for South Africa. So already in 2008, uh, South Africa joined uh, for the countries uh, within the Global Antibi Antibiotic Resistance Partnership. There are now uh, 15 to address uh, antimicrobial resistance. And the National Department of Health uh, of South Africa uh, defined its strategy uh, between uh, in 2014 for 10 years with different objectives uh, regarding management of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And 
one important thing, there was a, a huge pressure to transfer uh, of all the counter antibiotic stock remedies to the uh, Medicine Act, so the second one from 1965. <clears throat> in uh, 20, 2015, South Africa uh, joined uh, the global AMR surveillance system. And the uh, year after, the South African Animal Health Association uh, explained that they, they were supporting uh, the prudent and control use of antibiotics, but they uh, required uh, that registered antibiotics re to remain uh, with the Agriculture uh, Act, arguing about animal health and welfare. In 2017, the South African Veterinary Council um, pro proposed some, uh, some guidelines, and particularly regarding uh, the use of cholestine. And they they advise not to use it uh, in food producing animals uh, at all because of, of the uh, possible spillover of the MCR1 gene containing plasmid in the Enterobacteria C family. And uh, we will talk that uh, also a little bit later. Uh, in 2018, uh, the South, South African Veterinary Council published its guidelines uh, with regard to the use of uh, antimicrobial. And <clears throat> they uh, they focused on uh, also a compounded uh, antibiotic uh, with, uh, yeah, that are used in, in feed and water for production uh, animals. So, Keeping that in mind, uh, we will have a look uh, during this presentation to three different sectors, uh, poultry, milk, and pork. The two first one, uh, I will show you uh, some results of uh, temporal analysis of antimicrobial resistance. And for the, the last one, I will focus on a, a study done by one of my PhD about uh, a situation in one uh, one co uh, industry uh, commercial pig pig farm so the the gross income from uh, animal product in uh, south africa in the years of the studies so uh, 16 uh, 2016 2017 was about uh, 10 billion us do dollars with uh, the major part uh, coming from uh, red meat, poultry meat, uh, milk was coming just in uh, fifth position, and uh, the pork is not uh, shown on the figure uh, because it was a small part, but it's a very dynamic sector in, in, the, in the region. And uh, we had a huge focus uh, on it also because of its use uh, of, um, of antibiotic. So <clears throat> I won't uh, go too much in the details of all these, uh, these figures, but just to keep in mind that poultry industry is, uh, is a major industry in, in South Africa. And uh, for all these three sectors, uh, we can uh, define two types uh, of sectors. The commercial one with, uh, with uh, industry, uh, commercial farms and uh, the, the small and medium uh, size pro producer or backyard, uh, ba backyard producers. Uh, so regarding uh, yes, this uh, poultry and pigs, they are the one uh, using a greatest volume of antimicrobial uh, because of uh, the intensive uh, farming. And uh, it's important also to note that for commercial farms, they've got uh, high density facilities and they are using uh, antimicrobials in feed as either growth promoters or to treat bacterial infections. Uh, just to make a parallel uh, in, in uh, Europe, in 2000, there was a ban of antibiotic as growth promoters. And it showed, for example, that resistance to tetracycline dropped uh, to 50% uh, after this, uh, this ban, this is data from uh, 2016. Regarding uh, the, the milk sector, 
uh, antibiotics are used mainly for intramammary uh, treatment, for mastitis treatment, and also for dry co-therapy. And um, so just for the, the first study that uh, we will have a look to, uh, it, it concerned the poultry and milk industry. Uh, where uh, for poultry, we, we looked at uh, E. coli, which is a predominant bacterial disease. And for milk industry, uh, we had a focus on uh, Staphylococcus uh, aureus. And we, we were uh, lucky to have uh, some, uh, some data uh, 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 over several years. So seven years of follow-up uh, of diseased and or dead uh, bird uh, for poultry uh, industry uh, coming from, uh, from the, the industry itself. Uh, they were recorded uh, all this data and uh, they did some uh, isolation and identification. We had more than 3,500 uh, cultures and we were look looking at, um, at anti-microbial uh, uh, resistance uh, through the minimum inhibitory uh, concentration um, technique. And we were testing that for 11 antibiotics. For the milk industry, we had uh, 11 years of follow-up. Uh, we seen the, the milk lab of uh, understopod veterinary faculty uh, just to do some routine other health monitoring program. And this allow us to have about uh, 3,500 milk antibiograms of uh, 830 commercial dairy dairy herds. So <clears throat> a total of 2,200 antibiograms uh, were, were used uh, for using uh, for antimicrobial resistance using the disk uh, diffusion methods and the resistance were uh, was tested for eight antibiotics. Sorry. Uh, so <clears throat> first of all, uh, in the milk industry, you can see that we we had some uh, uh, high level uh, of resistance, particularly uh, for beta lactams such as ampicillin and penicillin, with correlation between both of them. We had also uh, some correlation with ampicillin and clindamycin, with also very high level of resistance. Lower uh, level of resistance were recorded for cloxacillin and oxytetracycline with some correlation be between uh, the both of them. And uh, cefuroxim uh, showed a low level, uh, a lower level of resistance. And if we look at uh, tylosine, uh, which is a, an antibiotic that is a, uh, used for systemic uh, antibiotic, it's it's almost not anymore effective with a, a level of resistance around seventy percent. So, looking at uh, geographical uh, repartition of the the resistance, uh, mm -hmm. we saw that uh, some uh, region were less uh, less affected by resistance, such as uh, KwaZulu Natal. Um, and uh, looking at uh, annual uh, variation of resistance, we saw also that uh, for some antibiotics, uh, spring uh, was a, 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 a season where we had a lower uh, rate of antibiotics. So we, we tried to put that in relation with, uh, with uh, some uh, practices. And in fact, if we look at uh, spring, particularly in KwaZulu Natal, this is the season for calving, where also the cattle are are, are, are put in the pace in the pasture. So this is uh, pro probably a good explanation of the lower level of antibiotic uh, antibiotic resistance because there was a, a lower pressure of antibiotic at, at that time. Um, some uh, some um, 
some uh, interaction was uh, quite interesting, particularly, for example, the winter in the Houteng uh, province, where we had a low level of uh, antibiotic resistance. And this is probably because this uh, winter is a dry cold uh, season with frost in Houteng. And uh, <clears throat> there is a lower uh, prevalence of uh, uh, intramammary infection and then a lower level of treatment. There were less insects also. And this is probably the explanation of this lower level of resistance during this uh, season in this region. Uh, we can have a look at the, the temporal uh, trends uh, for, for different uh, antibiotics. So for these uh, two ones, uh, par particularly tylosine, as I explained before, uh, it's almost uh, non-effective anymore. Um, and because you can see the, the, the trend varying between 40 and 80%. Regarding uh, cephalexin, so it's not uh, as pregnant uh, because uh, pregnant because we reach a level of twenty uh, percent, but because of the use of cephalexin in uh, in human, it's quite uh, worrying uh, also. <clears throat> And if we have a look to uh, ampicillin and uh, cephor cephoroxime, we can see that there is a drop in the in the resistance, which is probably uh, due to the improved other health management. There was a program uh, within the farm that was launched launch, uh, during these years with early treatment of clinical and clinical intramammary uh, infection. Uh, with inactivation of quarter or curling of cows, isolation, separate milking, and improvement of uh, milking hygiene that could probably uh, exp explain this uh, tra train of decreasing uh, of the resistance. Uh, all these data have been uh, published. Uh, I will uh, give you uh, some reference at the end of the, of the presentation. Um, just now, having a, a focus on this, uh, this cholestine resistance uh, genes. So uh, you, can, you probably remember at the beginning of the, of the year 2010, um, 10s, uh, we had this, uh, this first uh, paper about the emergence of uh, this uh, PMCR. Um, in animal and human beings in China. And just uh, after, uh, in 2016, we had the, the first uh, isolation uh, in South African uh, uh, patient and also in, uh, in avian, um, uh, in, uh, in the poultry, in the poultry sector. And then it was uh, lots of publication about the, the spread of this uh, gene all over the world at that time, and which was very worrying, uh, particularly uh, for, for, for uh, human being. And this explained that uh, in South Africa, the Veterinary Council uh, advice not to use uh, cholestine anymore in uh, in animal uh, in in uh, feed produ food producing animal. So if we look now uh, after the milk industry to the poultry uh, industry, there was this late emergence of uh, this uh, gene. Uh, in uh, in uh, South Africa, shown uh, in twenty sixteen, and if we have a look of uh, resistance to cholestine uh, between the year uh, twenty ten and twenty sixteen, it was uh, at very low level, but it starts uh, to increase uh, in twenty fourteen twenty sixteen. Mm -hmm. We are reaching a level of 15%. And just at that moment, as I explained, there was this uh, 
this uh, advice from uh, the Veterinary Council of not using uh, any more cholestine. And in fact, it allows uh, the level of resistance. So it's not shown in the figure, but we, we add the information, a, a part of the study, that the level of resistance for, for cholestine dropped uh, below 1.7% uh, 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 in 2017. So there was a, a, a good uh, relation between uh, the use or the, the stop of the use of cholestine and the drop of uh, its uh, level of resistance. Looking at uh, other uh, antibiotics such as uh, oxy, uh, oxy tetracycline, we, we, we saw that there is a high level of resistance uh, with a uh, because it's widely used as a as growth promoter. Uh, for phosphomycin, uh, we had uh, a high level of resistance because of uh, a long-term use of these uh, this antibiotics, more than 30 years. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, industrial in the poultry uh, in the poultry sector uh, are not using it anymore, and this ex this explains the drop of uh, the level of resistance. For doxycycline, the resistance uh, follows the use also, and <clears throat> we we saw some uh, some cycles uh, because in twenty thirteen there was a reduction of the use, but in twenty fifteen. Uh, mycoplasma uh, issue uh, were at the origin of the re reuse of doxycycline, and we can uh, follow the the trend of uh, re increasing of the uh, the level of resistance for dox doxycycline. For our uh in uh, we can see also that it follows the use in 2013-14, uh, the Newcastle disease outbreak in South Africa, where arofloxacin was widely used to avoid a secondary E. coli infection. And uh, the affected uh, farms uh, use a continuous uh, mic, uh, monitoring, which allows also uh, the drop of the, of, the, of the resistance because of this management. And the multi-drug resistance was uh, at a high level of uh, 77%. And... <clears throat> It was uh, pre, uh, very worrying also for for the for, for the sector. Um, now, uh, after having seen these uh, trains, uh, temporal trains, uh, and uh, an annual uh, variation of uh, of antimicrobial resistance in the poultry and uh, milk sector. I wanted to have a focus on, uh, on a specific uh, situation uh, pig in, in pig production in South Africa. <clears throat> so where we've seen that uh, antimicrobial uh, are used uh, uh, widely in, in this sector. And uh, we wanted to have some uh, some more uh, clear uh, idea about the use of uh, antimicrobial, uh, and also about the prevalence and mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance for uh, Campylobacter uh, species, uh, Enterococcus and E. coli, isolated from fresh pig uh, fecal dropping, but also for from self collected uh, human swabs in commercial pig in one commercial uh, pig farm. So it was really a one else approach where we we wanted to to have a comparison between uh, results in human and animals. At the beginning, we wanted also to to sample the environment, but uh, it was uh, not possible uh, within this study. So we wanted to to see the uh, to assess the risk of transmission of AMR genes between uh, farm environment, farm employees, and pigs, and also to describe uh, the resistance. So regarding anti uh, antimicrobial use, there were uh, nine nineteen veterinary medicinal uh, products uh, used. Uh, almost three quarter of them uh, were registered under the Medicine Act, including uh, 
pleuromethylin, so the thiamulin that is used as a growth promoter. And uh, injectable tetracycline and antibiotic growth promoters, uh, mainly chlorotetracycline, virginiamycin, or olaxandox, uh, were registered under the Stock Remedies uh, Act. So the one uh, where you don't need uh, you don't need prescription. Uh, a single product was associated with uh, off-label use, a register for use in chickens, but it was uh, uh, one uh, one shot uh, of use because of uh, lack of other antibiotic at, at that moment. So regarding uh, the volume of use, you can you can see on the figure. So I just uh, highlighted the, um, the family. Uh, for which there were uh, some use as a gross promoter. So obviously, this is where you have the highest uh, uh, volume of, uh, of antibiotic uh, used. But you can see also that beta lactams are, are widely uh, used in this in this farm. And then uh, lots of uh, other family uh, of antibiotic are, are used. Uh, uh, and this was a study over uh, three years, so 2016 to 2018. So regarding, uh, regarding uh, bacterial, so a total of 64 human volunteers were recruited. Uh, we were uh, not able to isolate uh, Campylobacter from uh, the, the fecal uh, rectal swabs. But uh, we, uh, we managed to have 14% uh, 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 of uh, Enterococcus within uh, these uh, human rectal swabs with different species, uh, namely Fecalis, Ire, and Fecum. For E. coli, uh, they were isolated from 78% uh, of the, uh, these rectal uh, swabs. Um, and we had distinct uh, E. coli colonies uh, within some of these swabs. Regarding uh, pigs, a total of uh, 113 uh, dro uh, fecal droppings were collected. And we were able to isolate Campylobacter from 60% uh, of them, with uh, uh, within them 92% uh, of Campylobacter co coli, and 8% of Campylobacter uh, uintestinalis. For Enterococcus uh, species, they were detected uh, in more than 50% of the swabs with uh, different species also. Uh, as for for human and the isolation rate of E. coli was eighty seven percent, with some distinct uh, E. coli colonies also the, uh, detected. So regarding uh, the <clears throat> the resistance uh, to uh, antibiotic, you can see that we had a very high level of resistance uh, in pigs. Uh, so this is for Campylobacter. Uh, so high level of resistance uh, for tetracycline, almost 100%, and for strep streptomycin. Just keep in mind that tetracycline is used, uh, so oxytetracycline is used as a growth promoter, which could uh, probably explain this high level of resistance. But we can see also that we have high level of resistance uh, for ciprofloxacin, uh, and also for nalidixic acid. So regarding Enterococcus uh, species, <clears throat> we, we have for human uh, some uh, low level of re resistance. So for Enterococcus irae uh, isolates, they were all susceptible to all antibiotics. And for uh, Enterococcus uh, fecalis, uh, we had uh, some low level of resistance only for three of the antibiotics they uh, tested. But if we look at the, the profile of resistance for pigs, uh, it's another story where we have high level of resistance uh, for Enterococcus irae regarding uh, erythromycin 
And for Enterococcus fecalis, uh, once again, uh, high level of resistance for chloramphenicol, erythromycin, and again, tetracycline used as growth promoter. So looking now at uh, E. coli uh, isolate, um, we, we have uh, again some, uh, some differences between human and, uh, and pigs. And again, we can see that uh, the level of resistance is uh, much more uh, important for pigs uh, than uh, for, for, for human, uh, particularly uh, for ampicillin and uh, tetracycline. So looking at genetic uh, diversity between uh, human and por porcine E. coli isolate, we, we can see that we have some, uh, some relation using the, the PFGE. <clears throat> and uh, after whole genome sequencing, uh, we, uh, we, had, uh, we were able to, to draw this uh, minim minimum spanning tree uh, ba uh, based on, on different techniques. And we, we saw again this uh, relation be between uh, human isolates and porcine uh, isolates. And uh, we had some evidence from the hierarchical uh, clustering of a uh, transmission between pigs from different production houses, phases, and sites. So there was some cross transmission. Uh, there was also evidence of uh, transmission between pigs and humans, potentially due to proximity and transmission between humans, also pot potentially due to shared facilities. So as a conclusion for this uh, study, we saw that porcine E. coli isolates were more resistant to antimicrobials tested than uh, human, uh, particularly uh, looking at E. coli, but it was also true for uh, Enterococcus. Uh, PFGE showed a high level of genetic diversity among human and porcine isolates, and there was some potential of transmission and dissemination of uh, antimicrobial resistant genes amongst pigs and close human contacts. So <clears throat> this was for, for the, this uh, study in, uh, in South Africa. Now I just want to, to jump quickly uh, to, to Caribbean region. Uh, to discuss a little bit about this characterization of, uh, of uh, AMR integrated surveillance within the Caribvet uh, network. So you can see here the Caribbean uh, region in which uh, we had the Caribbean Animal Health and Veterinary Public Health uh, Network called Caribvet, which is a collaborative network involving 48 members, including veterinary service of 34 Caribbean countries and territories, as well as a Caribbean agency, regional university, research institution, and regional and international uh, organizations. The aim of this, of this uh, network is to improve animal health and veterinary public health in all the countries and territories of the Caribbean. Within the governance of Caribvet, we have several uh, working groups. And in uh, 2022, uh, the General Assembly of Caribvet asked uh, for, for the creation of an antimicrobial resistant uh, working group for, with the aim of uh, promoting, uh, pre prevent, uh, promoting preventive and control strategies for AMR in the region supporting and advising governments and official veterinary services to improve AMR knowledge using a wellness approach. So the first question of the group was, what is the baseline of knowledge and capability regarding AMR integrated surveillance in Caribbean member states? And thanks to the OSCAR project uh, funded uh, by uh, Interreg uh, funds uh, from the region Guadeloupe and Europe, uh, we, we were able to, to launch uh, a survey uh, within uh, a, a specific context where some countries in the region uh, did the tripartite AMR uh, country self-assessment survey. But for this survey, there were some limitations. So the information was only coming from national government and there was a limited ability to assess functionality and comprehensive of uh, national uh, pro programs. 
So our objectives in uh, our survey was to identify the progress of integrated surveillance plans for AMR uh, for CARIVET members, to identify weakness or threats to the AMR integrated surveillance plans, and to apprise laboratories' antimicrobial susceptibility testing capacities. So this study was uh, recently done, so end 2023, uh, uh, early uh, of this year. Uh, with uh, four questionnaires dedicated to animal uh, sector, food sector, environmental sector, and laboratory capability. We contacted 80 participants from the 34, sorry, uh, 34 Caribbean countries and territories, and contacted Ministry of Agriculture and Health, uh, Veterinary Public Health, and Academia. So the survey collected some data about uh, AMR integrated uh, surveillance program, risk assessment, uh, sampling and analysis, evidence of AMR, and gaps and challenges uh, for animal food and the environment. And for our labs, we are looking at the type of testing and uh, the target microorganisms and strains and the accreditation and quality assessment. So finally, we managed to report uh result from 16 uh, only 16 territories but it's a good start for the moment uh, with uh only uh, one country uh from sorry from the the 16 that has a pilot program uh, in each sector two uh, countries have a pilot program uh, in two sectors so uh, mainly uh, animal and food but all the programs are so far some draft uh, documents. Uh, four countries have conducted hazard risk assessments in each sector, and uh, one country has used their hazard risk assessment to modify their pilot AMR surveillance programs in two sectors. Uh, regarding demonstration of resistance, it was um, only within the food sector uh, and in the poultry and pork, and, uh, pork uh, sector, where uh, resistance were demonstrated for uh, Salmonella in poultry and Staphylococcus aureus in uh, porcine with uh, different antibiotics implicated. Uh, the capabilities of uh, of the, of the labs, so we had nine uh, participating countries that have a reference laboratory. Three labs are considered uh, reference labs for AMR. Six labs uh, are accredited uh, with uh, ISO uh, 17,025, uh, and they are performed antimicrobial susceptibility testing routinely or for research. And two labs uh, perform molecular genetic uh, testing with different uh, targeted organisms. So the main challenges for the AMR integrated surveillance program was some financial constraints, the lack of communication between sectors, some uh, political and financial uh, support lacking, uh, the absence of operational guidelines, the limited animal, technological, and material resources, and the responsibility of public sector staff uh, that are overloaded, and also the limited uh, laboratory capacity and uneven progress across sectors. So animal and food programs have the most progress while the environmental sector has, le has least uh, progress in uh, pilot AMR integrated surveillance programs. There is a lack of communication and coordination with seen and the most sectors in the, that endures uh, progress. And um, we saw that intellectual, technological, human, ma material, and economic resources are needed for any progress. And last but not least, the public health policy with a supportive legislature is needed to drive this progress. So we, we had some uh, different uh, term uh, goals within uh, this, uh, this uh, working uh, AMR working group within CARIVET. Uh, I won't go through all of them because we are back in time now. 
So as a conclusion, we saw that AMR integrated surveillance in Caribbean member states have not been implemented or there is minimal uh, progress. So the major changes are financial, human, technological, and material. And a targeted health policy and legislature are necessary to support uh, the animal health, food, and agriculture, as well as environmental sectors in their AMR or surveillance in the region. So just to, to finish uh, this presentation, I just wanted to remind that this AMR needs a holistic and transdisciplinary approach. So you've, you've seen a little bit through the different presentations, the link between uh, human and uh, and animal, but uh, it's not only uh, with that. So just reminding the, the words of Robinson, uh, that antibiotic resistance is a quintessential one health uh, issue. And this first, uh, first uh, scheme from uh, Linton uh, is all, uh, all, um, always uh, very important to keep in mind, even if it has been uh, adapted uh, more recently. So all this link between uh, animal, human, environment, and just to come in, uh, to come in back to the on, uh, antimicrobial resistance gene uh, that are found uh, in the environment, uh, with uh, the recent publication from then, we saw always this link between environmental, environment, uh, agriculture, uh, livestock production, uh, and uh, the human influence, as well as some uh, other. Um, uh, factors uh, uh, such as uh, thematic uh, factors uh, that are influencing uh, this, uh, this spread of uh, resistance machines. So just coming back to South Africa, uh, in uh, 2018, uh, the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries Together, joined together to draft uh, uh, a strategic uh, framework based on the one else approach. So this is this was very promising, uh, and within this uh, this uh, framework, there was specific uh, survey uh, topic on surveillance system for AMR in food producing animal uh, that should be established by uh, by now and uh, surveillance system integrated for animal, humans, and environment. And the surveillance system for residues in food of animal origin should be maintained also. So it was quite uh, this uh, um, application of this holistic approach. And just as a reminder also, there was uh, the launch uh, in and uh, 2022 of the AMR multi-stakeholder uh, partnership platform, uh, where we had uh, just yesterday uh, uh, a good uh, dialogue on antimicrobial resistance awareness in the Caribbean. Uh, how do we weather this storm? And just as a reminder also that uh, in, uh, in the coming uh, weeks, we will have this uh, UN high-level meeting on AMR and all under this uh, multi-stakeholder plat partnership platform that has been launched through the auspice of the Quadripartite Alliance. Uh, just as mentioned before, here are some uh, references, so we will share the presentation so you can benefit of them. And I just wanted to acknowledge all my colleagues and partners for, from uh, South Africa uh, and from the, the Caribbean region, I can go. I cannot go through all of them, but you have all their names here. Uh, some uh, some good colleagues that uh, so for some of them uh, did the studies. Uh, some of them uh, uh, provide me with some of these slides. So I thank you all of you uh, very much for your attention. I'm uh, I'm still open for questions. Hi, thank you very much for that presentation, uh, uh, taking us around the world, Eric, <laughs> in, in what's going on in the small stuff. 
the AMR. So we do have time for a, a few questions. Uh, we can ask some uh, that show up in the chat. I'll keep monitoring that. I do have one question for you, though, uh, as a moderator's uh, uh, prerogative to ask. I'm kind of curious about the uh, antimicrobial resistance profiles in, in South Africa between uh, for the Enterococcus faecalis and the E. coli, comparing between pigs and, and humans. Now, they were quite different. What does that tell you, or how do you interpret that in terms of the the degree of transmission of microbes between those two people and uh, two groups, like the people and the pigs, and, and when we think about a One Health perspective. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we were able to show uh, through with uh, world genome sequences, some uh, very few, but some link, uh, direct links between the strains uh, uh, typology of strains uh, between a human and pigs. So it was uh, some evidence of transmission. So we don't know exactly it, if it was coming from pigs to human or from uh, on the inverse uh, direction, but there was a transmission between them. And we, we saw also transmission uh, be, because there was, uh, I, I didn't uh, into too much in, in the details, but there were different sites of production. And we saw also for pigs some transmission from one side, one site to the other ones. And pigs were not circulating between the sites. So probably due to human transfer of faces or others. So, but transfers of this. Uh, uh, this uh, bacteria and obviously some of them were, were uh, showing some resistance as we've seen so there was a, a clear link between between uh, between the, the different sites for pigs and also between pigs and human even if if there were uh, very few of them there were some okay that's helpful all right, we do have another question. Uh, when you were talking about uh, the resistance and sensitivities of isolates recovered from uh, mastitic uh, udders, uh, were you basing that on ECOFs? Because there's no like uh, CSLI standards for uh, isolates. Yeah, can you, you explain expand on that a bit? <laughs> yeah, it it was it was a, a study so done some uh, some years ago but uh, we 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 had already this uh, this criticism uh, regarding the, the techniques yeah we were not uh, able uh, to do a minimum inhibitory uh, concentration uh, test but yeah we we did it uh, through this uh, this diffusion because as you've seen, it was some temporal data so it has been uh, over uh, more than 10 years. And uh, at that at that moment, uh, the standards were not as high as uh, as uh, they are now. And when they started, the techniques was only this uh, this this diffusion that they had in in the in the milk milk lab, uh, the vet, vet faculty of under support. Okay, that's great. Um, so you had a list of uh, short. Uh, medium and long range goals or plans for the Caribbean. Which ones of those things do you think? Uh, <laughs> okay, so I don't have a pool of money to give you. Okay, but what what would <laughs> your priority? I wish I had money to end up. Uh, what would your priority be? Like, what what is the key element stopping you from moving forward? Uh, I uh, to to it. I mean, as an epidemiologist there's never enough data, right? Yeah. And surveillance, more data collection is always great. But at what point are you, are, are, is there enough to, to say something or do something? What What is the next step that you really, the, the critical thing that you'd like to see done? Yeah, so uh, as you've seen, uh, in fact, uh, we, we we are just starting, in fact, our, our study in, in the region regarding AMR. We've seen uh, our group in, uh, in Caribbean Vet. 
And the idea is, yeah, to continue to collect uh, some data because, because as as you've seen, we we managed to have answer from uh, from uh, nineteen countries uh, and territories among the thirty four. So it would be great if we could have uh, more answer, obviously. And uh, we want also to to help uh, dialogue uh, between uh, the different uh, the different uh, regions to, uh, also to develop the knowledge of people that perhaps in your island in your country you don't have uh, the capacity in the lab but it, it just uh, two islands uh, from you there there are there is a laboratory where you can send a sample to 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 do some uh, amr monitoring so this is the first things we we really want to to see and obviously to link with all our partners in uh, in carivet uh, such as uh, fao woa uh, who also and uh, regional ones uh, ika usda uh, to to increase capacities for these labs to develop some uh, some education programs and also uh, if possible to have some uh, some influence uh, by showing uh, things influence on health policy and legislature uh, of the of the in the region and this will be obviously done uh, through the regional ins instance, uh, such as uh, the CARICOM and par particularly our uh, colleagues from CAFSA and CARFA, and uh, for other countries directly, uh, thanks to, to the good uh, relation we could have with them, such as with Cuba, with the um, Dominican Republic, or others. Okay, thanks. I see there's a, another question that came into the chat. Uh, this one's on South Africa and I read it and I kind of chuckled because I had this discussion this morning on a different project, on a different topic, uh, sharing of data. Um, you know, what do you think pushed the farmers to share the data in this study? Uh, how do you, what is the incentive to participate and, and more importantly, to share that data um, and, and then the other question is uh, related to connecting the laboratory data with the farm data, that metadata. How? Uh, that's not an easy task. Okay, so yeah. I, I so, give you an applause. I could find a little thing here for for being able to do that. That's a critical aspect. There's a lot of work involved. Yeah. But how did how did you manage to do that or put it together? Okay, so regarding the. Um... Yeah. The poultry sector. So we were lucky uh, that um, this sector is very well uh, framed uh, by industry. Uh, I'm not talking about backyard because we we didn't look at backyard. So uh, some other studies, more more recent ones, did it, but uh, at that time we didn't look at uh, backyard. But uh, so we were lucky of of this collection of uh, of data uh, done through the industry and the good relation also between the faculty and the, the industry that allow us to collect, uh, to, to gather uh, this, uh, this existing data that were produced by, by uh, um, I think it was Delta Mune uh, lab in, in, in South Africa. Can I just interrupt lab. there and ask you, how long have you been working with those farmers? Um, I, uh, for my part, I spent uh, six years in, in South Africa, but my colleagues, uh, it's a very long term uh, process. Yeah, so I'm just I, wondering, you know, the, the I was working for trust, just, for example, for, for the poultry sector with uh, Celia Bolnik, a colleague of mine in the in the faculty, and she has been working all her career uh, with with the sector, so with the industry. So it has been more than twenty. Uh, I won't I won't give figures for her age, but uh, I think more than twenty years of collaboration. So it's a really uh, a, a a good connection between them and a trust that has been built over the years. And for the milk, it was the same. It was uh, the, the milk lab in, in the faculty that were collecting uh, data from, uh, from the, the 
commercial milk producer. They had some, uh, I, as I, I explained, some uh, some program to help management of uh, others. And thanks to that, they, they were collecting these samples over, over the years and uh, keeping keeping them and uh, analyzing them for the the benefit uh, of the farmers and once again this was a win win collaboration because farmers were benefiting from uh, this information regarding uh, the 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 bacteria the type of bacteria the resistance they they could have and also uh, adapting also their uh, adapting their 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 treatment uh to that so it was again we, this uh, this trust that they had uh, between them and just uh just to end uh with uh, with that uh if you saw that uh, our last study in south africa was about pig and we did it in one commercial farms uh, commercial farm and at the beginning obviously we wanted to do it in in, in 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 several ones and it was because we didn't have the same relation uh with the the industry uh at that moment it, it was quite uh difficult to recruit uh recruit some uh some uh commercial farms uh to to work with us uh, in addition with that, the situation of uh, African swine fever in uh, in South Africa yeah. wo was getting worse at that time with uh, some spread of the disease outside of the control zone. So it was becoming quite difficult to enter in the farms and to have uh, to have some study done with them. And uh, last but not least, the study overlapped also with the COVID-19 uh, uh, issue uh, that yeah. uh, we had Sorry. also in South Africa. So we, we couldn't uh, go in uh, or, or pursue uh, the, the study in other farms. But yeah, really, uh, we saw the difference between the three sectors because we didn't add the, the same relation. And even if we were in, introduced by SAPO, so the South, South African uh, pork, uh, organiz pro, pro, pork producer organization, uh, they, uh, they very kindly introduce us to to the farmers, but it was it was uh, harder to to get the trust from from the farmers. Great. So um, we're kind of out of time here. I want to thank you for the fascinating presentation. Thank the participants for their questions and joining us. You see on the screen, our next uh, uh, knowledge dissemination dialogue will be in about uh, two weeks uh, on September 24th. The time change is different. We try to uh, vacillate uh, the morning and afternoons here in Rome so we can catch people on different sides of the world. Uh, Liz Parker will be speaking about the role of food and feed in the spread of antimicrobial resistance uh, before you sign off, I just ask you to fill out our questionnaire or feedback. Uh, if you have anything that you'd like to uh, communicate with us, uh, and again, uh, in a few weeks uh, we will have your uh, the presentation that Eric uh, presented to us posted online, so you could review it and get information. Thank you all for joining us. We look forward to seeing you the next time. Have a good day. Bye. <laughs>